This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Sudan's military vows to name civilian cabinet and prime minister. Egyptian president meets Libya's Hafter in Cairo. Mozambique needs humanitarian help as famine approaches. Hello and welcome to Africa Live. As always, great to have you with us. I'm Richard Cyril Nsa, live in Nairobi. And for those of you joining us across the continent and around the globe, we thank you for joining us. Let's take a look at other stories making headlines this hour. BP found guilty of building filling stations without approval in South Africa. And in sports, Tiger Woods wins the Masters to clinch his first major in 11 years. And we begin in Sudan, where an attempt to break up a sit-in outside the Defense Ministry compound in the capital, Khartoum, is underway. Since the removal of longtime leader Omar al-Bashir last week, Sudanese have taken to the streets demanding the military hand power to a traditional, transitional civilian government. The new ruling military council has vowed to comply, but by appointing rather an independent prime minister and cabinet to help govern the country. CGTN's Tuli Shabalala has that story. It's been four days since Omar al-Bashir stepped down from power. The military has the tough task of forging the way forward. Sudan's military council says Bashir's National Congress party will not be part of the country's new leadership. The National Congress Party will not take part in the new transitional government and I hereby reaffirm, in the name of the military council, that they will not be part of the new civilian transitional government. The military council says it is ready to work with the opposition groups. We have previously said in all our statements that the opposition forces are in charge of appointing the prime minister and his cabinet for a civilian government and we are calling on them to unite and have a united voice so that we don't take too much time to appoint a prime minister and form the civilian government. Protests still continue on the streets of Khartoum. Citizens are demanding civilian rule that will lead the country for the next four years. It's a new Sudan, full of peace, love and justice. And there won't be divisions or sectarianism or racism. And so, this past era will never come back. It's a completely new Sudan. Sudan is saying that there's no more sectarianism, there's no more racism, there's no more tribalism. We are all one, and what unites us is our Sudanness, just our Sudanness. The government has indeed been brought down, but we still have demands. We're waiting for them to be met. Among them, for all the leaders of the former regime to be handed over for international trials, or for them to face just trials here in Sudan, and for us to see it with our own eyes. The people are still waiting because they feel the people from the former regime have not been brought to any sort of trial. The Sudanese Professionals Association, which has spearheaded the protests, have posted a nine-point list of their demands. The list includes disbanding all pro-government unions, freezing the assets of top officials in Bashir's government, and dismissing all top judges and prosecutors. Tuli Shabalala, CGTN. Rapid leadership change is taking place in Sudan. Right after Sudan's military ousted President al-Bashir, several of the country's top security officials stepped down. Now, while that reshuffle indicates the rise of a new leadership and possible change, protesters are skeptical about the military's intention to cede power. Here is Adel al marki with more. After talks between the Sudanese Military Transitional Council and protesters reached a dead end, Defense Minister Awad ibn Awf stepped down. Replacing him, Lieutenant General Abdel Fattah Burhan. With Burhan, a security reshuffle followed that replaced several generals of the military council 
and the country's chief of intelligence. It appears to be a movement to appeal to the people rather than actual change. So far we haven't seen anyone arrested for corruption from the previous politicians. It's like the entire administration disappeared in a blink of an eye. Even al-Bashir's arrest, many people are doubting it. Burhan lifted the curfew and released most of the political prisoners. He promised to hand over power to a civil government, but Sudanese protesters want to see tangible changes in the political system. Burhan has to dissolve the ruling political party, the militias that support al-Bashir's administration, and to proceed with many steps that proves he's moving on the right path. Sudanese people don't want to just change faces of the administration. They want radical restructure. Until this political process is over, protesters declared that their rallies will continue. What Burhan has led so far was to undo decisions taken from his predecessor against protesters. He is still affiliated to President Omar al-Bashir's military establishment. So he will need to take more measures to prove his sincere commitment to the protesters' desires for change and stand against a regime he has served most of his career. Adil Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. Meanwhile, the president of Egypt, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, has been meeting with Libya's uh, East Commander Khalifa Haftar in Cairo. Photos released on Sunday show Haftar sitting with Sisi and his head of intelligence, Abbas Kamel. No other details about the meeting were immediately available, but reports suggest that the two held talks over the situation in Libya. Egypt has close ties with Haftar, whose Libyan National Army controls the east. The Libyan East Commander also took the mainly desert south earlier this year before moving to Tripoli days ago. He is under international pressure to halt and advance on the capital, the latest major escalation of conflict in the divided nation. President Sisi held discussions with the commander of the Libyan National Army, Field Marshal Khalifa Haftar, in Etihadea Palace. Official spokesman of the presidency, Bassam Radi, said that the discussion tackled the updates and developments in Libya. All right, for more on this, we are joined live in Cairo, Egypt, by CGTN's Adel El Marki. Adel, thank you for joining us here on Africa Live. First things first, Egypt's President Abdel Fattah al Sisi on Sunday met in Cairo with Khalifa Hafter. What was the outcome of the meeting? Adel? Discussed the um, uh, situation within um, Libya and the recent uh, campaign that Khalifa Hafter is leading. Um, Khalifa Haftar, the LNA forces, claim that they are moving in a counter-terrorism operation. And in that regard, Egypt believes that it is essential to continue um, counter-terrorism efforts and um, counter-militias uh, uh, and counter-extremist um, uh, groups as well. So in these area, Egypt has given its full support um, to Khalifa Haftar as it believes that eradicating terrorists and extremist Islamic groups is very essential for the stability and sovereignty of Libya. Uh, Libya and Egypt share a very long uh, border, about 1,200 kilometers long, and stability in Libya in the soonest time is something Egypt is very keen to achieve. And in that line, they have um, shared some intelligence and shared um, um, sort of plans of how they can collaborate in the future in the files of counterterrorism. Well, as you have mentioned, Adel, Egypt has close ties with Haftar as well as Libya's UN-backed government of national accord. Uh, talk to us more about how President al-Sisi is dealing with the situation. Unpack it for us. For Egypt, a political solution or to end the conflict and the war is something crucial. Um, it will mean that the influx and the attempts to breach the Egyptian border will significantly decrease. Egypt believes that a unified military uh, is crucial for Libya to achieve that. And in that uh, side, it believes that General Khalifa Haftar plays an essential role. Uh, politically, there are concerns from the rise, the rise of Islamist uh, groups, extremist Islamist groups in Libya, uh, who many of these groups are based in the western side in Tripoli. And therefore, it has also opened dialogue with Faiz al-Sarraj. But besides Faiz al-Sarraj's role as a UN-recognized um, head of the transitional or the presidential council in Libya, uh, Egypt has not been intensifying its collaboration with 
them uh, with Saraj as much as Haftar. Uh, the most of the collaboration and the most of the support uh, goes to the eastern side, which is closer to Egypt and where it controls the border that Egypt is most concerned about. All right, Adele, what more is happening right now in Libya? Can you share with us? In Libya, there is um, still the clashes are going. The number of casualties are rising. Uh, WHO says over 120 uh, people have been killed, uh, more than 600 injured. And there is still uh, a grow expect in these casualties number as the war um, moves forward. The number of air raids that um, the LNA conducts on the western side has doubled uh, in recent days. Um, and they are attacking the headquarters, the suspected uh, places where there are arms and militias uh, to be there. Um, these uh, movements doesn't seem to be stopping and the Libyan uh, army says they will continue. Uh, on the other hand, the Libyan, the western side, the GNA side, the government of National Eckert, they say that they're moving their forces from defensive to counter uh, attacking the Haftar forces, trying to push them away from increasing um, these, their advance toward the Libyan capital. Haftar's forces, however, are not going to Tripoli from one side. They are moving in about seven different axes, trying to close in on the headquarters of the government and close in on the core of the Libyan city. But uh, the closer they get, mm. the more violent it is expected and the higher the casualties are expected to fall. All right, Adel al Maruki, excellent reporting there. Thank you for bringing us that story. That's Adel al Maruki live in Cairo. It's time now for a short break. You are watching Africa Live on CGTN. A lot more news coming your way, including... Airstrike kills Islamic State deputy leader in Puntland region. Mozambique needs humanitarian help as famine approaches. From coastal defense to open waters, from a surface fleet to a comprehensive force, the People's Liberation Army Navy is undergoing a strategic transformation. Come on board with me, Han Bin, for an inside look as China's Navy sets sail into the future. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back to Somalia Now, where an airstrike has killed Abdi Hakam Dukup, the deputy leader of the Islamic State group, alongside another militant in the semi-autonomous Puntland region. Now, according to the United Nations, Dukup helped set up the first cell of Al-Itihad, Al-Islamia, an ideological predecessor to militant group Al-Shabaab. He later defected to an Islamic State. The group is believed to have at least 154 soldiers. Meanwhile, Somalia has been battling Islamist militancy for more than a decade. Well, we are joined by Dr. Abdi Fattah Ismail Tahir, who is the deputy chairman for the Union of Peace and Development, Peace and Development Party in Mogadishu. Doctor, thank you for taking time out to join us here on Africa Live. Let's get into it. An airstrike killed the deputy leader of the Islamic State group in Somalia's semi autonomous Puntland region. How significant is the killing? Um, 
the, uh, the killed person definitely represented a very clear threat to not only the state of Puntland and its people, but also to the Somali uh, public at large. So it represents uh, a very clear uh, significance. But in addition to that, um, there are two important uh, points to be mentioned here. One is that uh, there is a division within uh, Daesh Somalia and that division was between uh, the uh, leader and his deputy, the, 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 the killed one, Abdi Hakim uh, Muhammad Ibrahim. So on the one hand, the airstrike solved uh, uh, the, the, the problem for the leader of Daesh in the sense that his opponent, who would have divided uh, the group and definitely would have weakened their ability to strike, uh, has been killed by the American airstrike. On the other hand, the killed uh, deputy leader uh, was kind of um, dialing to the international Daesh uh, based in Syria and they clearly supported him to take over from the current leader, Abdul Qadir Mu'min. And again, that is another issue. So in the bigger picture of, so of Somalia becoming a second uh, herb for Daesh activities, that airstrike also solved that problem. But in general, uh, I mean, airstrikes also have uh, the weaknesses, uh, especially when you don't have uh, uh, support from the ground. All uh, right. And that increases the civilian casualty. Doctor, let, let me ask you this. How relevant is IS in Somalia and Puntland regions? Uh, Daesh is, is small in number, uh, but they are extremely effective in the sense that uh, they organize themselves in uh, a guerrilla manner, they uh, uh, operate um, as a terrorist network, and um, definitely uh, they, they, they expand um, uh, each day. So it's, it is uh, definitely gaining more grounds. I mean, Al Shabaab too is expanding in the south uh, and the central part of Somalia. Uh, so the less we change our tactics of fighting this terrorist network, uh, they will keep on uh, gaining strength. Well, there are reports of IS expanding its territory into Africa after being forced out of uh, Syria. What is the situation? Can you expand on that for us? The, situ the situation is bleak here in the sense that uh, we are living in a brown, uh, in, a, in a conflict brown region uh, where you have Somalia, you have Yemen nearby, uh, you have Ethiopia which has a certain level of insta political inst instability, uh, you have uh, Sudan which is going through a tremendous uh, political problems, you have Eritrea which is a fragile state. So uh, definitely the region is very attractive to terrorist networks like uh, I mean, uh, Daesh uh, relocating itself to Somalia uh, definitely represents a very clear threat, not only to Somalia, but also to the region and the international uh, community at large. All right, Dr. Abdi Fata Ismail, let's leave it there. Thank you uh, so much for, for your insights. We hope to be speaking to you real soon, and we will be following this story here on Africa Live. Moving on now, in Sudan, an attempt to break up a sit-in outside the Defense Ministry compound in the capital Khartoum is, is underway. And since the removal of longtime leader Omar al-Bashir last week, Sudanese have taken to the streets demanding the military to hand power to a tra transitional civilian government. The new ruling military council has vowed to comply by appointing uh, new leadership. Uh, we are joined by Dr. Gamal Abdel Gawad, Professor of Political Sciences at the American University in Cairo. Uh, thank you for taking time out to join us here. Sudan's main protest group has demanded for an immediate handover of power to a civilian transitional government. How feasible is their demand? Is it realistic? Uh, well, I, I, I find this demand more of a symbolic or rhetorical rather than realistic one. Uh, looking at the uh, configuration of power uh, in the political arena in the Sudan, uh, uh, some sort of power sharing between civilians and military is, uh, is needed at this, at this point. 
uh, functionally speaking, the military could provide the bridge Sudan needs to cross from the previous regimes to the future regime, but uh, 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 completely discarding the role of the military and uh, handing power to civilians, I find this more of a, a political, uh, symbolic, rhetorical, but not really realistic. Uh, demand. It's a part of the uh, power bargain that's taking place in the Sudan rather than a realistic demand, in my view. All right, Dr. Gamal Abdel Gawad, let's talk more about that. I guess the question that really needs to be asked is Is Sudan ready for a civilian government? Doctor? Well, l let me put it this way a civilian government could be appointed. Uh, but uh, can a civilian government effectively rule in the Sudan? I think this is a big question mark. Uh, the challenge in the Sudan is not only about who is sitting in the formal positions of power as cabinet members or so, uh, but if he can really take authoritative decisions and uh, 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 make the state apparatus, the government apparatus, government employees, uh, all over the country to abide by those rules. I find this a very serious challenge to a civilian government in the Sudan. We have to keep in mind here that the previous uh, regime, the, the regime of Omar al-Bashir in the Sudan was uh, 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 based upon a political ideological uh, Islamist group and uh, uh, during the 30 years in power it have been able to uh, the regime has been able to penetrate and to control uh, major positions and junctures of the state apparatus of the Sudan so if uh, a civilian government sitting on the top of this uh, apparatus that has been occupied by uh, 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 Islamist ideologues for 30 years it is uh, really a serious uh, a challenge there for this uh, government. I wouldn't, I wouldn't really advise the opposition in the Sudan to put themselves in this, uh, uh, in this test alone. All right, Dr. Gamal Abdel Gawad, one final question before I let you go. You spoke of the opposition. The military has said that it's ready to work with opposition groups to establish a new civilian government. My question to you is how long do you think this is going to take? And most importantly, in your opinion, what needs to be done before a civilian government is actually established? Well, yeah, the, the, this part about what is needed to be done is really important a question. I, I think first, uh, uh, the, the, the different opposition groups in the Sudan need to reconcile and agree among themselves. Yes, there is a, a, a vibrant opposition movement in the Sudan, but uh, it is made of a large number of small factions, and those factions need to uh, 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 talk to each other and decide uh, and talk in one in one voice. Secondly, uh, Sudan needs some sort of constitutional arrangements to uh, manage the transitional period. Uh, there will be a civilian government, fine, but uh, where the uh, the sovereign power will stand? What what will be the role of the uh, of the military uh, council? What will be the role of the military? We need some sort of uh, constitutional arrangement there. Thirdly, we need agreement upon a roadmap how to move from here to there, from the current situation to the uh, final status, the final outcome of the transitional process where there will be an elected government, the parliament, etc. So uh, b b prior to that, it is uh, any other decisions that will be taken will be a kind of a hasty move than the decision taken within the current power struggle rather than part of an uh, integrated part of, uh, of a plan to, uh, 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 to establish a functioning political and stable regime in the country of the Sudan. All right, Dr. Gamal Abdel Gawar, Professor of Political Sciences, uh, talking to us from Cairo. Thank you so much for your insights and analysis. Moving on, it's been a month since Cyclone Idai struck central Mozambique. The death toll now stands at just over 600, and a huge humanitarian effort is underway. It is thought Mozambique may require aid assistance for the foreseeable future as a looming famine approaches. CGTN's Robert Nagila now reports the impact of the humanitarian assistance. 
At the corner of the airport in Beira, there's a hive of activity at an emergency centre set up to deal with the humanitarian crisis in the aftermath of Cyclone Idai. Every unit I have working here is led by the government. So you have a, a food security desk, you have a health desk, and they coordinate under me all the various elements that make the response possible in support of government. The figures are staggering. The government says the death toll now stands at 603. 1.8 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance, while close to 5,000 cholera cases are being treated. At least 73,000 displaced people are in 70 displaced camps. Many of them have lost their homes and their belongings. More than 1 million people have now received food assistance. We can affirm with certainty that we are facing one of the biggest natural disasters to hit Mozambique in living memory. From here, at the airport, aid is directed to affected areas in coordination with teams on the ground. We have assessed uh, several areas with the helicopter, so we have partnership with some uh, uh, foundations that have provided uh, free of charge uh, some helicopters. Helicopters are heavily relied on. Much of the affected areas in central Mozambique are still flooded. Where the roads have been repaired, aid is now coming through in large consignments. We are continuing to look at areas that are in need and how to reach further flung communities with shelter kits, hygiene kits, all the different things that people need. In the meantime, aid continues to arrive at the airport, but much more will be needed in the coming months. More than 1.7 million acres of farmland were flooded in the aftermath of the cyclone, destroying crops. Since the cyclone, the country has faced one crisis after another. And with the looming farming and economic hardship on the horizon, it may be a while longer before the all clear is given. Robert Magela, CGTN, Beira, Mozambique. And staying with Mozambique now and with the road to Boozy Town now repaired by the government in the aftermath of Cyclone Idai, a CGT and crew was able to reach the town. And as our correspondent Robert Nagila reports, the once thriving provincial capital in Sofala in central Mozambique is but a shadow of its former glory. Let's take a look. Seated on the veranda of his damaged hotel in Boozy, Rudolf Chinedi recalls March 16th vividly. When it started, it was whistling. Trees, roofs, everything was flying. It was terrible. Virtually any building you come across in the town of Buzi, you'll see this watermark. This was the level of flood water on the 16th of March, more than 24 hours after Cyclone Idai passed through this town. And like so many areas in this region, the flood water has yet to completely disappear. These were the images that shocked the world, leading to an unprecedented rescue effort from the air. By the time the floods had receded, 108 people were dead. Now, on the ground, the town resembles a war zone. Not a single building in Buzi was spared. The local police station's roof, like many others, blown away. When you go around town, you can see that there's more than 90% of the houses that are actually seriously damaged. Many of them totally destroyed. The latest figures from the government show 112,000 houses were destroyed by Cyclone Idai. A further 111,000 were damaged, while 15,000 were flooded. At what used to be the local market, Francisco Mbereketu has come back to his stall to salvage what he can. I have lost everything, including my house and family. I am left only with the clothes that I am wearing. There is still no power here. Most of the power lines still where the cyclone left them. Many of Buzi's residents have now left. It is doubtful they will return. But crucially, humanitarian assistance has started arriving. Back with Rodolfi, he shows me the damage to his property. He lost 67 cattle on his farm alone. I ask him if he'll rebuild. At 69 years of age, his life's work is gone. His silence speaks volumes. Robert Nagila, CGTN, Buzi, Mozambique. 
Let's go to Ethiopia now where President Donald Trump's eldest daughter Ivanka Trump has met with members of the Ethiopian Women's Coffee Association in Addis Ababa. In an hour-long session which included traditional Ethiopian coffee ceremony, Trump pledged and reiterated her support for the group and other women's startups. Trump is on a four-day trip in Africa to promote global women's initiative she's leading. It aims to economically empower 50 million women in developing countries by 2025. Well, it's been five years now since uh, terror group Boko Haram abducted 276 girls from their school in the remote community of Chipok in northeast Nigeria. Some of the girls later escaped. Over 100 were released in a deal, though, between the government and Boko Haram. But 112 of the girls are still being held. Advocacy group Bring Back Our Girls has been marking the fifth anniversary of the abduction, demanding the release of the remaining 112 girls. Here is CGTN's Deji Badmus with more on that story. If there's one group that has ensured that the world does not forget the missing Chibok school girls, it is this one. Not only has the Bring Back Our Girls campaign group been constantly reminding the world that 112 Chibok girls have still been held by Boko Haram has been consistently mounting pressure on the Nigerian government to do all it can to get the girls back and alive. What are we demanding? Bring back our girls. This march across some major streets in Lagos is to mark the fifth anniversary of the abduction of the school girls. They eventually ended up at the local UNICEF office in the city where they passed on their message. We are aware of the efforts made so far, and we commend the government for the recovery of 107 Chibok girls and 106 Dapchi girls. We also acknowledge the honor and sacrifice of our police and military, and express our condolences and prayers to the families of our heroes in the police and armed forces. However, we will not relent in our advocacy and strident demands for the rescue of our school children and fellow citizens from captivity. We also demand justice for the slain, resettlement and rehabilitation for people displaced by the violence, safe schools, and the launch of the National Missing Persons Register. The group later returned to this port under a major bridge in the city, where they've been holding sit-outs every week for the past five years to press for the release of the missing girls. Among the group is this man from Chibok, whose niece is among those released by the terror group. He says his community prays every day for the release of the remaining missing girls. But please, I'm appealing to government to bring our girls. Where are they? Five years is too long, for God's sake. Five years is too long. The Chibok girls are representative of other abducted Nigerians. But we talk about the Chibok girls because at the time when they were abducted, it was the first time that such a large number of people were taken. Not only that, we actually know their names. We know what community they are from. We know their parents. Um, 19 parents have died in the times in between. President Buhari has also been speaking on the fifth anniversary of the abduction of the girls. He issued a statement saying he has not forgotten the missing girls, renewing his pledge to ensure they all return home to their parents. He also said efforts have been intensified to secure the release of the girls and all the Nigerians still being held hostage by Boko Haram. The president, however, stopped short at putting a time frame to when the release is likely to happen. The Bring Back Our Girls group on their part say they would not stop their campaign until all the missing Chibok girls are brought back home safely. Deji Batmo, CGTN, Lagos, Nigeria. In South Africa, after several attempts, International Animal Welfare Organization Four Paws has succeeded in transferring 47 zoo animals out of the Gaza Strip. The rescue mission was originally scheduled in March, but had to be postponed due to regional unrest. Now, two of the five lions were flown to Lions Rock Big Cat Refuge in South Africa. CGTN's Yolisa and Jamela has more on that beautiful story. Morton and Pisa named by rescuers from Animal Welfare Group for Paws South Africa, landed at O.R. Tambo International Airport in Johannesburg a few days ago. The pair are among 47 animals rescued from a zoo in Rafa on the Gaza Strip. The remaining 45 have been relocated to partner sanctuaries in Jordan. 
Four Paws says living conditions for the wildlife were simply not ideal. Most of the zoos, let's say in um, in the west part of the world or in uh, in uh, Asia are trying to comply with animal welfare and are trying to improve their conditions. But of course in uh, war zones or in uh, in East Europe, a lot uh, of the zoos are under standards and they, um, the problem is not that they expose the animals to the public without any possibility to hide or whatever, but they are also involved in trade. So animals are simply disappearing or, and this is very, very uh, critical in the moment. It was uh, a very uh, long process and with a lot of obstacles. So whenever the lions are finally arriving here, a big weight goes, but uh, still they will have long way to, to recover. Both lions will be closely monitored and four paws will evaluate their well-being throughout. The lions will now have an opportunity to flourish and cast off all the shackles associated with the trauma that they experienced. They finally can live in a natural environment and live in a species appropriate way like a big cat should. Four Paws Sanctuary houses more than a hundred big cats rescued from zoos, circuses, war torn areas, and the canned hunting industry. Morton and Pisa are joining Simba and Said, two lions rescued from zoos in Mosul and outside Aleppo in 2017. They will also soon adapt to their new nurturing environment. From Morton and Pisa, we can see that they don't know, really, really don't know grass under their feet or like an uneven ground because obviously the natural ground around us is, is not even so they are very careful when they're walking and they're kind of exploring now. It's still early days though for the two of them here. We managed to uh, release them out of the crates and uh, Motan was the first one to go out uh, Pisa took a little bit more time. She was, I think, more scared and she felt safe in, the, in that small crate. At this lion's rock sanctuary, they will be provided with a home that gives them the peace, safety and comfort in an environment that enables them to heal. You listen to for CTN in Free State Province, South Africa. All right, this is Africa Live. We've got your business news coming up after the break. Don't go away. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back. British multinational oil and gas company BP has been found guilty of environmental crimes in South Africa. The oil giant now faces fines worth millions of dollars for building filling stations in Hauteng without an approval. This is believed to be South Africa's first ever successful private prosecution for environmental crimes. CGTN's Yulisa Njamela has more on that story. BP is now an environmental criminal in South Africa. The oil giant faces potentially big fines. BP was indicted not by the state, but by an environmental group, Uzani Environmental Advocacy. What happened was, in terms of the promotion of the Access to Information Act, we asked for copies of the, the departmental registers in terms of 24G. And in the Gauteng register, we discovered that BP had applied for rectification of 21 filling stations mm. that they had constructed unlawfully. Mm. So what they were charged with was 21 charges of having constructed filling stations without any prior environmental authorization. The advocacy group accused BP of failing to protect the environment. But it's, it's an attempt to ensure that the environment is better governed, better protected, all for, the, for future generations. 
The advocacy group says BP's failure to do environmental checks before building the filling stations could lead to ground pollution or an accident. One of the concerns yes. is that the tanks may leak, yes. but they can, leakages can also occur when petrol gets delivered. Yes. Leakages can also occur when, when the petrol attendants overfill vehicles. If people, there's any number of potential sources for pollution, and especially in, in an area, that, a dolomitic area, or any other sensitive area with a perched water table or, or the like, you need to take special precautions. The judgment against BP opens the door for a large number of similar prosecutions, perhaps on thousands of counts of historic environmental crimes never prosecuted by the state. The primary intention with this prosecution of BP, or the two primary intentions, is firstly to set a precedent so that the law is set, and secondly, we're hopeful that the, the judge will give our foundation a, an award that will enable us to take on these other cases. But the old giant disagrees with the judgment. In a statement, it says it's considering its options. BP argues that no filling stations were built in environmentally sensitive areas and that due diligence was taken to ensure that there are no disasters that occur. BP also argued that the process was unfair as it had already paid fines when it applied for post authorization. You listen to Jamila for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. The African car market is predominantly made up of secondhand cars. However, global auto manufacturers are looking to crack the market, which shows promise of rapid growth as trade tensions threaten sales worldwide. Now, used vehicles in Africa are considered cheap and plentiful, considering the relatively low prices from the origin of import. Africa accounts for just 1% of the world's new car sales and the majority of those are in South Africa. Auto manufacturers are now lobbying governments to limit car imports to allow them to start local production. According to Reuters, more manufacturers are set to get 10-year tax breaks if they set up in Nigeria, Kenya and Ghana. We started um, scanning the markets and we, we looked into ways of, of opening them up because they're, they're literally not functioning right now due to importation of used vehicles all the way from Japan or the US. It's a dumping ground for used cars. First of all, I lose, I lose my source of revenue because I normally feed my family, I educate my children using the, the proceeds I get from the car business. Meanwhile, in Beijing, where Chinese Premier Li Keqiang has met Japanese Foreign Minister Taro Kono, China and Japan wrapped up a high-level economic dialogue on Sunday in what was widely seen as a boost to bilateral ties. The two countries commence. Uh, commerce ministers also held talks. They agreed to strengthen their partnership in trade and investment, regional economic integration, and global economic governance. CGTN's Yang Shuao has more. Addressing their often fraud but fast-warming partnership, the foreign ministers of China and Japan put their differences aside to hail its potential and outlook. China and Japan are back on track for new development. In terms of economic activities, we are seeing deeper, more vibrant and stronger ties in many more fields now. The high-level economic dialogue co-chaired by Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi and his Japanese counterpart Taro Kano in Beijing was the fifth round of such talks since 2010. The dialogue resumed in 2018 after an eight-year suspension. Last year also saw the ice-breaking exchange between Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and Chinese Premier Li Keqiang. During this Sunday's dialogue, about 10 ministers from both countries, a much larger delegation than last year, discussed key economic issues ranging from trade to tourism. The three-hour meeting was held behind closed doors, but according to earlier reports from Japanese media, Tokyo was expected to ask China to lift restrictions on imports of Japanese food, which were introduced after the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster due to concerns over radioactive contamination. Tokyo was also predicted to raise the issues of intellectual property and data protection, and Japan's earlier decision to exclude China's telecommunication equipment makers Huawei and ZTE from government's 5G purchase contracts were expected to be on the agenda. The dialogue comes about two months 
before Japan will host this year's G20 summit in Osaka. We are exchanging ideas on the possible visit of Chinese President Xi Jinping later this year. We hope to make this happen. Meanwhile, the two foreign ministers also called on young people to join their special friendship mission. Together, they launched the China-Japan Youth Exchange Promotion Year on Sunday, a program which promised 30,000 youth exchanges between the two countries over the next five years. Yang Zhao, CGTN. And on to Brexit, the UK government is looking to resume talks with the opposition Labour Party on how to resolve the current deadlock. David Liddington, deputy to Prime Minister Theresa May, says they will review any progress made once Parliament resumes on April the 23rd after the Easter break. Among the topics for discussion is the country's future relationship with the European Union. Meanwhile, during his visit to Tokyo, British Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt reassured Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe that the UK government is determined to avoid a no-deal exit. American Airlines has announced the grounding of Boeing 737 MAX planes until August the 19th. The company had previously planned to keep the planes out of commission until June the 5th. Doug Parker, CEO of American Airlines, says they are confident the 737 MAX 8 fleet will be recertified prior to August the 19th. Earlier this week, another major American carrier, Southwest Airlines, said it would operate its 34 aircrafts of the same model starting August the 5th. All right, time now for a short break, but when we return. A South African man feeds and swims with sea creatures. Africa Live. Find your voice. All right, this next story seems really, really interesting. To South Africa now where an unusual friendship between a man and a group of stingrays near the southern tip of Africa has garnered notable attention. Ernest Lonsdale, or the Stingray Whisperer as he fondly goes by, has become somewhat of a local celebrity for his uncanny ability to interact quite closely with large groups of ocean-dwelling stingrays. CGTN's Travers Andrews has more on this report. Let's take a look. It's a sight that could send shivers down anyone's spine. Ominous black shadows patrolling the waters and looking poised to strike. But these gentle giants are certainly no killers. But the famous race by stingrays, who have become habituated to humans and show a remarkable ability to interact with locals and tourists. They are especially close to the Stingray Whisperer, who has for a number of years put in a show with his ocean-roaming friends for hundreds of people. I have certain tour groups that come through and they always try and make a stop for the Stingrays, which gives them something more than just the tip of Africa and the lighthouse. Yeah, the Stingrays become important as well. The interaction and curiosity of the Stingrays all started with Parry, an animal released by the two oceans aquarium in the nearby orders, who came in search of food. The landing of fish along with the blood and guts in the water enticed the rest of them, and now Ernest plays a part in feeding them larger chunks of fish, but at the same time educating those interested in their behaviour. Ours are used to feeding every day from the boats and from people, so they're very gentle around people. They don't bump you and stuff like that. The Stingray Whisperer's interactions are built over a number of years and the group just seems to be getting bigger and bigger. There are more than 20 individually known Stingrays that patrol this coastline every single day for a free meal. But tourism associated with these Stingrays is critical for this small fishing village. We rely heavily on the interests of visitors who are actually coming to the southern tip of Africa near Gullis. Tourism per year is very, very important. And that is a small village, a sea, a, 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 a official village. I can call it a official village. It's only one shop worker and one in Agalas. So that is a small village and all the people is coming to the site. From the tourism, it's a lot of here. 
But now though Ernest has been training his dog Shadow to also begin forging a friendship with the Stingrays. And most days they do oblige to his antics, just like the famous Whisperer. Travis Andrews, CGTN, Straits by South Africa. What a remarkable story there. Moving on, Chinese wigs have grown in popularity internationally, mainly due to their high quality and delicate craftsmanship. The practice of wearing a wig or adding hair extensions has taken root in many African countries. Let's now take a look at how the hair products are imported from China. The cost of beauty has over the years been proven to know no bounds. Jessica, a 22-year-old Congolese woman, frequently travels thousands of kilometers to China to purchase hair wigs, motivated by the high demand for the product back home in the DRC. But it's not a cheap venture. I come three times a year. And uh, when I come, I take uh, 10,000 pesos. And he cost me 200,000 US dollars. In 2017, China exported $3.2 billion worth of hair products. Africa was its second largest market with a 34% share. And according to the general manager of Henan Rebecca Hair Products, in Nigeria alone, the company sells 9 to 11 million hair product items per year. The trading volume of wigs in European and American markets increased some 50% year on year, but it's up by 100 to 300% year on year in the African market. In Henan province, workers have been making wigs and other hair products for decades. In 2018, the sale of wigs to Africa increased by over 200%, significantly boosted by the rapid development of e-commerce. Our business in B2C has mushroomed since the second half of 2017, and our customers are from 100 plus countries after starting from a minimal number of countries when we first started. We mainly sell our products to African countries. Although many synthetic hair products are still the best sellers, human hair products are attracting more African customers who are willing to and can afford to spend more. A number of Chinese wig companies have now set up factories in African countries, creating around 10,000 jobs for locals. And the potential for more expansion of hair product manufacturers remains high across the continent. Beryl Oro, CGTN. All right, we are ready for our sports news. Let's take a look at the headline. Tiger Woods wins the 2019 Masters to finally claim his 15th major title.